Okay, hi. Um, just a quick few notes here. So I haven't had anybody join um, yet, but um, um, so this video is for um, our week five assignments here for our operating systems class. So as a reminder, as I posted in our announcement, uh, this week is a little bit shortened compared to our previous four weeks. So we actually have to have everything wrapped up um, by Thursday of this week. So I did still keep the uh, problem set due on Tuesday and um, I kept the, um, the, uh, the program assignment due on Thursday at the usual times, but um, you know, we don't have any time after Thursday. So you do have to do the test. Uh, the, the, the last test five will be open um, starting on Wednesday. So you take it sometime on Wednesday or Thursday. So keep that in mind for your schedule things here so um all right so um i don't know i i have a little bit i should probably go over about the programming assignment uh but let me bring up the um oh, let me bring up the um problem set first to see if there's anything i wanted to mention about that So for the written problem set, um, there's three questions. The first one um, is I ask you to do some um, process scheduling, uh, like uh, we do in our lecture videos for this week and in our textbook examples. Okay, don't uh, don't let the you know change to like um, instead of having like a start time one two three where we're talking about, you know, our burst time um, being 60 milliseconds or whatever, okay? So basically this is the same as the, um, or you can treat this the same in this problem as the, um, uh, the, the service time, the total time for the process. And this is just the arrival time. Um, these processes do have priority. So as I mentioned on this one, I do ask you, our textbook doesn't, we, we've got uh, a feedback scheduler, which um, can, be used to do a kind of priority. Um, but um, here, um, um, I ask you to think of a scheduler that does things based on a non preemptive priority. So it's non preemptive. So that means that once a process is scheduled, uh, it will keep running until it's done. So we don't schedule, we don't dispatch the next process until the current process that's running is done. But at that point, when you're dispatching, basically, you just examine the priorities of the processes that are currently ready to run in the system and select the one with the highest priority. And, and hopefully this isn't too confusing, but this is pretty common in, in lots of operating systems. So here are the low numbers being high priority. So basically process two has the highest priority among all these processes as identified. Um, and process four is the next highest, so on process one actually has the lowest priority. All right. So um, question two has to do with the um, exponential averaging. So you'll need to read over that section and just produce a, a plot similar to the one on figure 9.9 .9 for these burst times. Okay. So to do this, you'll have to calculate, you know, like just the regular running average. You know, so, so the running average um, the first time is just the average of one value, so it's an average of six. And at the second time, it's just the average of two values. So six plus four is 10 by the two is five and so on. Right? So the running average is, is pretty easy. And then the exponential average, um, you know, you, you can look in our textbook for the, um, the, the, the way to implement that, right? Um, but uh, this is basically a way of, this is what I think of as a weighted average, right? So the alpha tells us how much weight to put onto the most recent observation um, and how much weight to put onto the uh, past observations when making the next prediction or, or uh, the, the next how you make predict. Um, and then for question three, we're back to doing process scheduling, but here I ask you to do a round robin scheduler, uh, round robin scheduling. Um, but uh, you have to do it with a two CPU system, okay? So in this case, um, our textbook talks a little bit about this in chapter 10. There's, there's really two extremes, uh, two different ways 
um, that you might handle a multi-CPU system. So one is you might just, whenever a new process is created or comes into the system, you might just at, right at that point when it's created, decide which CPU it's gonna run on. And then from there on, it always runs on that CPU that's assigned to it. So if you do it like that, then you can think of this, each CPU is having its own private ready queue that it um, um, dispatches um, the next process to run. Right? So that's one extreme. But um, this problem, I'm asking you to do the other extreme. So at the other extreme, we have just a single shared ready queue. All new process, processes that come into the system are put onto the end of that shared ready queue. Right? And then whenever a CPU is ready to dispatch, so if, if I have multiple CPUs, all those CPUs just dispatch from the common ready queue, right? So there's a few um, rules here in order to make certain that this simulation is uh, deterministic. There's no conflicts here. Um, so in particular, uh, yeah, if two CPUs are idle at the same time um, on uh, in, in this simulation by hand, then CPU one should dispatch uh, from the common ready queue first followed by CPU2. Okay? And the other way to disambiguate things on this third problem for the problem set is that if all, uh, if a new process arrives at some time t and if CPU1 and CPU2 are running processes and both of those processes time out all at the same time, then the order, then, then this, this first uh, rule here defines the order that sh they should be returned back to the ready queue. Okay? So in that case, the, the, the newly arriving process should always be put onto the ready queue first if you have multiple things happening at the same time on this simulation for problem three here. Uh, followed by the, if, if CPU one times out, then CPU one's process should be put onto the ready queue second. Um, and then if CPU two is also timing out at the same time, it's um, process should be put onto the ready queue last, all right? So with these rules, there should be no ambiguity. There, there's actually one correct way that the simulation for the third problem, for the problem set, um, will come out if, if you follow the rules correctly here. And if you do the, the round round schedule. All right, um, so yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and move on then to our, our um, last uh, program assignment here. Uh, let's people have some questions. So, um, it shouldn't be too surprising. We're also creating a simulation of a process scheduler since our last unit here is about um, scheduling processes on the CPU um, in an operating system. Um, so basically, you know, it's, it, it fits the pattern for all the, the simulations program assignments we've done so far. Um, so there's a few tasks um, to get the, the general, um, to get the, uh, the, the general um, simulation working. So we call that the, what, the scheduling system class, right? You have to, to get warmed up by creating a few getter and setter methods and so on. Uh, but then after that, like in our last, the, the, the program assignment four, um, um, there is um, kind of the, the, the main part of this assignment is um, you do have to uh, actually implement one of the other scheduling policies, okay? So we're using the, the same sort of um, framework that we used in the previous previous assignment anyway. Um, so in this case, you know, we've got a basic class called the um, um, scheduling policy class. Um, and then we derive specific scheduling policies as child classes, child instances of the, of the base scheduling policy, the, the virtual abstract base class, right? Um, so there is a first come first serve scheduling policy that's already implemented for you. You can use that as a starting point, but you have to implement um, one of the other scheduling 
scheduling policies, okay? So for our um, assignment five is a little bit more open-ended than assignment four. So for assignment four, you had to implement the clock scheduling policy. For this one, um, I don't even give you the, the starting code um, for shorting short process next or shorting race time. So that's kind of the main thing I want to show you to get started on that. You, you, you'll want to copy, start with the first come first serve scheduling policy, copy that over and rename that and then implement, right? Um, so like I say here though, you, you can choose, you know, shortest process next, shortest remaining time. Um, you can try to do a feedback scheduler. Um, 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 uh, HRRN would be a one to try. So to do a round robin, basic round robin scheduler if you want. Okay. So let's, As usual, let, let's start by looking at the uh, simulation files. Let me go ahead and open up the um, assignment here. Um, kind of as, as, as a reminder, like I did last week, um, do check that um, you've got your project set up. So uh, again, because of some of the, the issues that we had, um, you might not have Um, the .bs code and the .clang formats. Um, so if you're having problems like um, doing a um, doing a build initially, or if your code doesn't seem to be formatting, um, then you'll want to check those. Um, so once again, you should be able to copy those uh, from the same place that we did before. So those are like um, the, the clang format. Um, what was that? Oh, it's big. Yeah, so, um, you know, you can copy the, the C-Lang format from the config. This, this is in the announcement, um, but it should be, should have some, I don't think I'm doing that, so something's causing me multiple keys to be typed when I type something for some reason. Um, so you should be able to copy the C-Lang format from the config directory, which is two directories up from the assignment directories to .clang format. Um, likewise, uh, although you might have to do an RM for both of these, um, you can copy the, the VS code. Just from the parent directory two levels up. In this case, since it's a directory, you'll have to do a CP R. Um, well, anyway, just check those. And I mean, you might not have to copy those, it will depend. Um, if those are set up, you should be able to, for example, you should have the keyboard. If, if VS Code is set up correctly, you should have your keyboard binding. So you should be able to do a Control Shift 1. Um, oh yeah, so although you might need to reload, um, so let me try reloading here. I'll copy it over the .bs code. So, um, so yeah, I did mess something up when I did that. So,
I'm going to try and reopen this folder here. Check that we're building by hand here at least. So, you know, as usual, you, know, you should be able to, to always use the build system from the command line um, to do make clean and then make and then make test to run the tests. Um, Let's see if the feeling format is working at least. So set it to somehow. Hmm. I'm gonna, I might have to restart my system here. I might have to make a pause here. Um, I'm definitely having some problems. Getting something happening with my uh, keyboard input. I'm gonna try one more time to, to do that copy again here. So. I misspelled that because my typing problem there had two D's in there. I mean, that was what the problem was. I think I just misspelled the VS code because um, it looks like it works works now. It's, it's still out of hand, so. Okay, yeah, there we go. So sorry about that. So I just I probably just misspelled the VS code when I copied it over. So, so yeah, anyway, so you should be able to use your keyboard shortcuts. If the um, if uh, C line formats up correctly, when you do save, it should reformat your code for you. 
All right, so um, let's move on. Um, so the simulation file, input files for our simulation for assignment five should look pretty similar because um, these are exactly the same format as the simulations in our textbook. But basically, you know, we get three, we get uh, uh, input. The first line is just the number of pro total processes in, in the system that are going to be simulated. And then we get like three columns of input. So the process name, the, um, this must be the, the start time. So, so the second column is the start time. And then the last column is the service time. So the total amount of time that the process needs to run. Um, so, so yeah, the, I mean, the first things to do, the first four tasks are all um, finishing some functions in the scheduling system class starting with some getter and setter methods. So uh, let's look at the scheduling system. So this has some similarity to the um, one you did on assignment two, where there we were also kind of uh, uh, simulating uh, part of the scheduling system for managing and managing processes, right? So you got a lot of that, that same, uh, stuff in here um, that we did on programming assignment two, um, including we've got a, a separate process, although it's just a, a simpler structure this time uh, to keep track of the arrival time and service time and all that information about all the processes that are being simulated. Um, and then we have that the same format that we had on the previous assignment four. Um, where we have a scheduling policy instance that we actually use to make the scheduling decisions whenever we need to dispatch or, or figure out whether a process should, that's running should be timed out. We call our scheduling, use the scheduling policy um, object instance to make those decisions. So uh, we keep a table of processes. Um, um, which are these process structures here in the scheduling system. Um, and um, like I had for the solution for assignment two, we basically just keep track of the, the identifier, the PID of the current running process. So this is just an index into the process table um, in order to implement our simulation here. So, so yeah, I mean, the first task is to implement um, like get system time, get number of processes. So if we go back to the, the test here, um, the, first, the first unit test for this assignment is just simply testing like get system time and um, get, uh, let's see here. Get number process is CPU idle, get running process name. So to all those um, methods here, but I think you have to implement all of those. So let's see, let's look. So like um, get system time. So this, these will all be initially stubbed out to just return zero or something. Return two, we have to implement all those, get those working for the first task. Um, and then after that, the other three are usually just implementing one um, member method or maybe two um, in order to actually get the simulation running and complete. So, okay, so I'm just, I'm gonna kind of skip over and leave that as, um, you know, as, uh, hopefully most people can figure out that part. Um, uh, 
So um, the final bit, um, like I said, is, is you do have to implement one of the scheduling policies. Um, now, this is a little bit more open-ended, so there's a little bit more stuff you have to do than, than you have to do for assignment four, okay? So you'll want to start with the first come, first serve policy um, as, as like a starting point. Um, so um, scheduling policy. So like I said, you know, the, the scheduling policy is really just an abstract base class that defines the API for any scheduling policy. So the, the kinds of things that a scheduling policy has to do is um, it has to be able to be told when a new process is created so it can, can manage it. Uh, it has to be called whenever a dispatch decision needs to be made. So whenever the CPU becomes idle, we call our scheduling policies dispatch function to decide uh, and it will return the process identifier of the next process that should be dispatched according to its policy, whatever policy it's implementing. Um, a preempt method. So the uh, the simulator is going to be calling the preempt method um, pretty much every clock cycle, asking the scheduling policy if the current running process should be preempted or not. Right. So for non-preempting policies, you don't really have to do anything for preempt. So if you pick a non-preemptive policy to implement, um, and, and uh, first come first serve. Remember, if well, maybe you don't remember. If, it depends on whether you've started on your assignment that your uh, unit five stuff yet or not. But first come first serve is an example of a non-preemptive. So when we run over here and look at first come first serve, you'll see that preempt you, it doesn't do anything. So you, you can just uh, always return a uh, false for a non-preemptive. Um, and reset policy is just so that we can uh, start again and run a new simulation. So let's look at the first come first serve. So first come first serve is a you know a child. It's, a, it's an instance, a concrete instance of the scheduling policy. So uh, it actually implements these. So these are no longer uh, virtual functions, right? Um, and then let's, let's look at the implement. So remember, or uh, um, uh, once you go through and learn about the scheduling policies, if you haven't done them already. Um, first come, first serve, basically just it's non-preemptive, um, the simplest kind of policy that you can implement. Uh, and basically, the, the, like the name says, the first process that comes in will be scheduled to run first. It will run to a completion. And then after that, we look. And if there's another process waiting on, on the queue, we take the next one that, that, that arrived. We just execute them in order. So that's what first come, first serve. Um, so for first come first serve, um, an easy way to, to get the next process that arrived, right, the, the one that's been waiting the longest is just to keep a ready queue. So for first come first serve, the way we implement it is we just keep a, use a standard template library queue of process identifiers. So whenever um, the simulator calls new process, uh, with the process identifier of the process, we just push that on our queue so that we can then use that queue when we're asked to dispatch to figure out which is the process that's been on the queue the longest and thus was the first one to arrive of, of the waiting process. Um, so then dispatch is, is relatively easy for first come first serve. Um, uh, I mean, if, if the queue is empty, then um, there's nothing, I mean, we can't run a process. So in that case, when the queue is empty, we just return idle. So for any of these scheduling policies, um, if you can't dispatch, if there's no process that's ready to run right now, you should return idle if you're asked to dispatch a process. Otherwise, for first come first serve, we just pop the um, item off the front of our ready queue and return back as the process that should be dispatched by the simulation sim simulator. Okay. Um, and as I've kind of already talked about, First come first serve is non preemptive. So the preempt method uh, just can always return false when asked if it should preempt the current running process, right? If you implement a preemptive method, you have to do something, you know, you have to make a decision whether I should preempt the current process or not, right? So, for example, for um, shortest remaining time, if you implemented that, that's a preemptive scheduling uh, policy. And, and, but that's preemptive only on process arrival, right? So to implement preempt for shortest remaining time, 
um, you would just have to check if um, a new process just arrived, right, somehow. And if, if a new process just arrived, then um, um, you would return true instead of false, that, that we should preempt so that we can then make a scheduling decision, right? Figure out which is the shortest, the process with the shortest remaining time. Um, okay, so to, to, to wrap up on this, um, so what I wanted to show then is that um, in order to do the, the second part of the assignment here, uh, you have to pick and implement um, one of these schedulers on your own. Right. And in this case, we didn't give you the starting template code. So you have to do a little bit of modification of the make file this time. Um, and you're going to have to actually create and add um, a file to the, the, the project. Okay. So let me show you how to do that. That'll be the final thing. So you want to do these steps. Let, let's say, let's stick with short remaining time. Let's say you decide to do short remaining time. So um, I did have a question. So somebody asks, how would you handle preempt for a feedback scheduler? Um, um, so preemption on the feedback scheduler works the same way as preemption for um, a, a more basic round robin. Um, so it's going to work with a um, 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 a, a time slice quantum, right? So for the feedback scheduler um, and also for round robin, you would have to add in something so that you like uh, if we say that you know the time slice quantum for the system is is four time steps uh when, when the new process is started um, you would set that to be four and, and then every time the um, um process runs um you would uh, or basically every time you get a, a, a question whether I should preempt or not, you would want to dec decrement the current running processes uh, time slice quantum four three two one and then when when that gets down to zero so in preempt you you'd be de decrementing that wherever you put that right so you can put that in different places um, and when, the, when that gets to zero then you would return true for the preemption um, and, and that's that would be that. That's kind of the general um, approach. Um, how you would how you would handle the, the preempt method for feedback or for any, anything where you're doing time slice, um, so, uh, you know, handling a time slice quantum um, for your process. All right, but that, that was a good question. So. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, and, and I'm being a little bit vague and open-ended on that because there's lots of ways that you could go about doing that. I mean, you could you could add the um, and, and and it's fine if you want to. You could you could um, um, add a few things to the process structure if you needed to. For example, um, so so in assignment two uh, for our process class, we actually have a, a member variable that kept track of of its time slice quantum for the process. So you could put it in there. I don't think it's really necessary for this simulation to do that. You could just have a global variable for your round robin or your feedback scheduler that just says whatever the current running process is, what's its remaining time slice quantum, right? So just, just a single variable for the, the current running process. But we're just using a single CPU system uh, in this simulation here. All right, um, anyway. Well, oh, and by the way, um, now I'm thinking about that, I do believe that there's already some hooks in there for handling the time slice quantum. So for example, if you look at the, um, for, for those schedulers, if you decide to use a schedule that, that does some time slice quantum, um, you know, scheduling for dispatching. Um, so if you look at the, um, the SIM, Um, it does have that as a command, command line option, so you can pass in the time slice quantum to use for the simulation. Um, and we, we parse that out, right? So if you provide 
that command line argument. We parse that out to a parameter named quantum. So then, um, and I had some commented stuff out in here so that you can use that. So for example, if you do use, if you do implement like a round robin scheduler, um, uh, you'd want to pass that in so that your round robin scheduler knows what the time slice quantum is that's being stimulated um, on the system. Same thing would go if you did a feedback scheduler. So if you implement a feedback scheduler, one of the parameters for a feedback scheduler is the time slice quantum. All right, so yeah, let, let me go ahead and um, let, let's just jump to the chase then. So let's say, um, I'm gonna say, let's say you decided to do shortest remaining time, all right? So what you'd wanna do in that case, you'd wanna start by just copying. So I think you can copy from Visual Studio Code's browser there. So I did like a shift click to do that. Well, let's, let's do this one at a time so I don't confuse myself. So I think I can just do a control C and then control V, and that'll make a copy of the file there. Uh, now you can probably right click on it or something, and there's other way, or F2 to rename it. So you'll want to stay with the same pattern. So let's say we're doing shortest remaining time, like I'm saying. So, so I want to have a shortest remaining time policy header file, HPP. And um, then I'll make a copy of the implementation file. And rename that to short remaining time scheduling policy. Dot CPP. All right. So now we need to do a little bit of refactoring. Uh, once you've done that, so I just copied over, but everything is still first come first serve in my short remaining time. So the easiest thing would be to learn how to do, you know, a global search and replace. So I think it's control F, so maybe um, control S. Control H for find and replace. So, um, so for example, the best thing to do here would be probably if I just um, change capital FCFS to capital SRT, I'll get everything I need. All right, let's try that. So we want to go from a first come first serve or short remaining time in this case. So let's go back up here. And then if you're confident, you just do replace all. Replace them one at a time and watch what we're doing here a little bit. So although go also, you know, you should you should also go back and check that your comments are still correct. So these comments won't be correct for shorter committing time. So I should go in here and, and, and change my comments for my class um, and the implementation. Do make certain that you change the um, the, the the guard for the header file, um, because if you have names the same, so if you don't change that, your compilation will have problems because it will not, um, it, it will not keep one of these um, if, if you have it like for some for serve for your guard around the if defs uh, in two different header files. There you go. Um, so besides changing comment, I think I got everything I needed there. Save that. And um, of course, we need to do the same thing for the um, source file as well. So the, the good thing about refactoring like this is that we'll uh, have a relatively good running start and we'll have all of, you know, so, so you know, this class does have to implement the same API. So we're going to have all the same methods. These will just be the methods for the shortest remaining time, scheduling policy, preamp, preset policy, look back, and so on. 
So that again, besides change, going back and maybe changing the comments to be correct for my new policy, um, I should do it. So now the only thing we have to do is we have to get this file added in, into the build system um, and then also added in so it can be called by the simulator. Um, so um, here um, um, we do need to add this into the make file. Um, so you will have to make some small changes to the make file um, in order to uh, build your new scheduling policy um, um, and test it and, and, and run it. Right? So you want to open up your make file. Um, and what you need to do um, is um, anywhere that you see first come first serve, you need to also add in um, your scheduling policy that you're trying to add to the build system. right? So in this case, um, we need to add first come first serve to the list of sources. I'm going to select that, do the control C and then control V. All right, so I can put short remaining time um, as .cpp and .hpp file of sources of this project. This is what's used to do the make submit. So it'll include your files in your submission packet when you submit it. Uh, be careful here. These, these um, backslashes at the end of the lines are because make files um, actually need everything to be on a single line. So by putting this, it's technically, this is all just one big line, but it makes it more readable, but you do have to make certain that I have a backslash on everything except for the very last um, file on my list of sources here. So there we've got the source remaining time added to my sources. We also need to add it to the objects so these are the uh, object files that need to be built in order to um, compile those into the test and the simulation executables. So, um, so again, you make certain you have that backslash, except for on the very last line, we need to have shortest remaining time. Um, on this example, um, added to the object files um, that are targets to be built here. Um, and then finally, um, I don't think that this will actually cause a problem for people, but um, you should, and I think you should be able to copy the, the pattern that's there. So you should add in these additional uh, prerequisites for the, um, uh, for the policy that you're adding in. So, uh, so like first come first serve, Object file depends on the, 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 the CPP file. Um, um, oh, there should only, uh, that's a mistake there that you don't need two copies of that. So let's fix that. Anyway, so all this is saying is that first come, first serve object file depends on the implementation file, the header file. So if I make any changes to either of those two files, it should rebuild the, um, you know, the, the first come first serve scheduling policy uh, code it should be rebuilt. Right? We need to do the same thing for short remaining time. So if, um, if the, the CPP source code file or the um, scheduling policy, oh, I know why there was two. It should have been, um, There we go. Did I mistakenly, was that what it said before? So maybe I was just misreading that. So first come first serve depends on both the CPP and the header file, but it also depends on the header file if it's base class. And so yeah, and so, so having all three of those is kind of a good idea. But likewise, source remain time should depend on the CPP and the HPP file. And also the scheduling policy that HPP, the, the, the base class. You have something similar to that, um, and if I didn't make a typo, hopefully that's that's all, all you would need to do to get the make file to work. Um, and at this point, we can try it and see if it builds correctly. Okay, so um, you know, so before doing anything, so it should build. It'll just be doing actually be doing first come first serve, even though um, it says that it's supposed to be the shortest remaining time scheduling policy. But that's okay. We can go back and modify it later. 
So that's kind of about the minimum you need to do that, that you can see that it, it's actually building and added into your system now. So let's go ahead and try and build it. Um, A, a clean. Um, so to check whether this is building or not, you'll want to pay more attention maybe than you usually do to the outputs and doing the, the make all or the make. So in particular, you want to make certain that it is like, like for example, right there, uh, it is compiling your policy that you just added um, and you're not getting a compilation error, right? So we just compiled the SRT into the SRT.O file. And then also pay attention that it's actually linking in the policy that you added along with first come first serve and the others into the test executable um, and into the um, sim executable. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, if you did this point, if, if um, you know, if, if you do these after doing the, the initial four tasks, you should still be able to, you know, run your test and all your tests should be passing like they were, right? Um, or they should be doing the same thing they did before you, you added in the SRT. So there's no unit test of new policy that you add in. You have to test it yourself, right? Um, and then as a final thing on that, um, to test it yourself, you'll probably want to add it in so that you can, uh, you, I mean, probably you, you need to add it in to the, um, to the simulator so that you can at least run simulations with your policy, right? So in particular, so, so I had some commented code out here, but you can do the same kind of thing. So um, like um, if I add it in, Shortest main time. I can put an else if statement for shortest main time. Um, in that case, what we want to do is create a shortest main time scheduling policy, which we will then use for the simulator um, as, the, as the, the scheduling policy to use for the simulation that we want. So, in order to make this happy, um, we will have to include the header file. Um, so I'm not certain if that's why it's complaining about policy in there, but um, um, we do need to also include our header file here. Um, oops. There we go. Oh, uh, I did miss my, new, my equal my assignment there. Oh, common rookie mistake. Uh, I need to do a Boolean comparison, not uh, an assignment. There we go. All right, let's see if that builds. I'll do, I'll do a clean build, rebuild everything again. Okay, so we're still compiling that in. So the difference now, though, is that now that since I added in that else if statement to the um, simulator, um, I should be able to um, um, run a simulation with the shortest remaining time. Although, again, it's still just doing first come, first serve, but, um, but that's fine. So I should be able to do sim with a, a P policy. Um, Do it on our first set of process table uh, inputs here. So. There we go. 
there. So yeah, and, and it is actually running. So um, and presumably it's on the sort of moment. So doing that, then um, you ought to be able to by hand figure out what the correct result should be for running whatever policy you choose in terms of the final um, schedule and the final statistics that you get. And um, Yep, so that's, I think that's everything I can think of. Um, at least as far as uh, working on your own scheduling policy for the fifth assignment. So yeah. now at this point, basically, once you've got a compiling and able to run, you'd have to go in then and actually modify these functions to um, implement your chosen policy. All right, um, let me see. It's, let me know if there's any questions here, but uh, yeah, I think, I think there's nothing else to add. Or at least that should be enough to hopefully um, let people work on the, the more open-ended second half of the assignment here. All right, um, yeah, so question, questions. If not, it's about a good time here, so I'll probably go ahead and wrap it up. Um, as usual, I'll go ahead and post this for any of you all that are watching these asynchronously. Um, as usual, you know, feel free to send questions. Lots of people do send questions while they're working on these assignments. Um, um, I'll be happy to push you in the right direction, um, uh, help you out, uh, even send your code, I can always run it um, and um, uh, see what, what actual tests are failing or whatever, so. Okay, um, well, I will see you guys later then um, and uh, have a good day.